It's lovely to be here with you today. My name's Luke Geary, and in Salvation Army circles, if you've met me, you either know me by one of two names. First would be Luke the Lawyer. The second will be Jackie Chan. You might wonder about that last one. Well, my origin within the Salvation Army goes back about 20 years, and uh, I was welcomed into the Salvation Army through breakdancing. I'm not going to elaborate on that just now. Safe to say there's a great story there, and if you meet me in the future, be sure to ask me. Now, I want to talk to you about a very important verse for me personally, but also I think for a lot of the lawyers out there who I speak to and interact with every day and um, who I think as their default favourite verse of the Bible, they go to Micah 6, 8. And uh, it really speaks to some really important questions for us as people and what really is at the core, at our essence of being. wasn't those two questions I had just there, but really... What I want to focus on today is giving you some answers. By the end of this session, you will know what God does and does not want from you. You'll be able to translate what God wants from you to do into your own world. You'll know that you're part of a movement that has God's focus in its DNA, and you'll be empowered to do what God wants in your life and to go out into the world and act every day consistent with God's wishes. Does that sound good? All right. We'll go straight to the text of the verse. And uh, in preparing for today's sermon, I spoke with a friend of mine who made a mention to me that she really loved the message translation. And uh, having reflected, I think uh, you'll get a little bit out of this too. And we're going to start back at the beginning of chapter 6 in Micah, the book of Micah. Micah, if you don't know, was one of 12 minor prophets. And uh, he is famous for having prophesied where Jesus was born, and that is in Bethlehem. And uh, he comes from a fairly underprivileged background and this particular chapter of the Bible talks to I think Micah's experiences and his perspective on what he um, is being told by God as the priorities in life and you'll see that's reflected here and he tells us in this uh, chapter uh, in in different uh, perspectives the first perspective comes from God and he says listen now listen to God take your stand in court if you have a complaint tell the mountains Make your case to the hills. And now, mountains, hear God's case. Listen, jury earth, for I am bringing charges against my people. I am building a case against Israel. Dear people, how have I done you wrong? Have I burdened you, worn you out? Answer, I delivered you from a bad life in Egypt. I paid a good price to get you out of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam to boot. Remember when Balak, king of Moab, tried to, to pull and how Balaam, son of Beor, turned the tables on him? Remember all those stories about Shittim and Gilgal? Keep all God's salvation stories fresh and present. Then Micah changes the perspective and from the Israelites, he indicates this. How can I stand up before God and show proper respect to the high God? Should I bring an armload of offerings topped off with yearling calves? Would God be impressed with thousands of rams, with buckets and barrels of olive oil? Would he be moved if I sacrificed my firstborn child, my precious baby, to cancel my sin? But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do. And this is Micah talking to the Israelites. What God is looking for in men and women, it's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. I just want to compare that with the NIV translation and just sort of at the tail end where Mike is talking uh, from the perspective of the Israelites. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And then finally, to compare that last piece of the verse, verse 8, the contemporary English version. The Lord Lord God has told us what is right and what he demands. See that justice is done. Let mercy be your first concern and humbly obey your God. Now, It should be easy. I think deep down we all sort of have a sense of what justice is, right? 
well, looking at one of the commentaries in preparing for this morning's sermon, said, act justly, according to one commentary, is described as, when in a socially superior position, step in and deliver the weaker and wrong party by punishing the oppressor. It's pretty emotive language. Do we always get the chance to punish the oppressor? Do we always see it that plainly, so obviously, in our everyday lives? As a lawyer, I come into circumstances in cases where we do have those sorts of facts in front of us where we can act for the good guys and we can win against the bad guys. But I've got to say, in 20 years of myriad court cases and some ugly things that I've seen and been part of as a, as a legal representative, justice can be much more complicated than that. You see, I think for us to understand and to deal with this verse in the Bible, in Micah, I think we have to appreciate that justice otherwise requires a very thoughtful consideration of what is right, but having regard to competing interests. Now, no doubt, you're asking me, what's the flute story? Great question. Thank you for asking. I'm going to tell you. There's a famous philosopher by the name of Armada Sen. He's a Nobel Prize winning philosopher. He wrote this book called An Idea of Justice. And in the book, it's a very lengthy book, very complicated and uh, very dry, but there is one pearl in there, one really clear illustration that um, is very, very relatable as to the complexity of justice, and it really gives it three dimensions. And in it, he tells the story of three little kids sitting in a village. Not really any distractions, just three little kids, Anne, Bob, and Carla. The three kids are arguing. They're arguing over a flute. And they're arguing really over who gets to keep the flute. And Anne says, guys, out of the three of us, I'm the only one that can play this flute. It's right that I should have this flute. You guys couldn't do anything with it. And the other two look to Anne and they say, well, yeah, yeah we agree. You're the only one that can play the flute. And frankly, if you had only heard Anne's plea for the flute, you probably would agree that it's a just cause. But then Bob says, hey, it's great that you can play the flute, but, you know, I'm poor. I don't have anything. I don't have any toys. I don't have any possessions. This flute would mean the world to me. And the other two say, yeah, okay, we get it. You don't have anything. And so if you only heard... Bob's plea for the flute, you probably would agree that it's a very just cause. And finally, Carla, however, says, yeah, don't you guys understand? This was a piece of wood before I came along. I took the wood, I carved it, I put holes in it, I made it a beautiful musical instrument. This was my making. I worked for it. I earned it. I have the rightful claim to this flute. I don't tell you that because uh, there is a, a simple answer. And, and if I said to you about Carla's last plea, you probably would agree that there's a very good case for Carla to have the flute. The reason I tell you, though, is just to go back to what seemingly was easy in the earlier commentary I referred to about punishing the oppressor or doing right for the wronged party. It's not that straightforward. That's why I was really attracted to the context and the wording of the message translation which said do what is fair and just to your neighbor that's how it referred to justice and, and acting justly all right well having heard the flute story where justice is not so straightforward how do we know how to act let's look at our identity the salvation army is and has always been an evangelical justice movement in fact the international mission of the salvation army is stated as, the Salvation Army, an international movement, is an evangelical part of the universal Christian church. Its message is based on the Bible. Its ministry is motivated by the love of God. Its mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in His name without discrimination. I tell you, friends, it's not enough to wish for justice or to complain because it is lacking. Yes, we should wish for it, and yes, we should complain when we see it lacking, but 
We are called to act justly. We cannot answer the call if there is no action. I want to tell you a story about the Salvation Army in the 19th century in England. This was an electrifying time. The 1880s. In the 1880s, matchstick manufacturer Bryant and May employed nearly 5,000 people, most of them female and Irish or of Irish descent, although the numbers varied with the seasonal fluctuations of the market. By 1895, that figure was 2,000 people, of which between 1,200 and 1,500 were women and girls. Now, at that time, there were 250 million matches used in Britain each and every day. The matchboxes were made through domestic outwork under what was called a sweating system, and it is what it sounds like, effectively a sweatshop, but it was a sweatshop in your own home because it was cheaper, and such a system was preferred by these manufacturers because the workers were therefore not covered under the Factory Acts, which were laws in place to provide certain bare minimum standards for workers, safety standards, pay standards, other rights for employment. And the rates of pay for these sweaters were, frankly, woeful. The workers even had to provide their own glue and string from their own funds. Regularly, almost invariably, the workers' pay was docked for fines, for trivial things. Things like keeping an untidy workspace, talking, or having dirty feet. Shoes were too expensive at the time, so most workers were barefoot. Fines were also issued for having a burnt match on their workbench. Now, white phosphorus, is bad. This gentleman here, as you can see, has a deformity in his jaw. The bone has disintegrated. He has what's called fossy jaw. This was a very, very common disorder for people who worked amongst white phosphorus in the late 19th century. So what's so bad about that? Well, fossy jaw was phosphorus necrosis of the jaw, and it was caused by the vapour of the white phosphorus destroying the bones of the jaw. And that manufacturer I referred to, Brian and May, were aware of this. And in fact, if a worker complained of having a toothache, they were told to have the teeth removed immediately or they would be sacked. So what do we do in this instance of injustice? As a evangelical justice movement, well, one year after the publication of the treatise in Darkest England and the Way Out, written by William Booth, this amazing vision of uh, conquest of the Christian church on the evils of the world. In 1891, the Salvation Army opened its own match factory in the Bow District of London, and it used less toxic red phosphorus, and it also paid better wages. Part of the reason behind this match factory was the desire to improve the conditions of home workers, particularly including children, who would dip the white phosphorus-based matches at home and in fact, some of them died. You can see on the screen there the lights in darkest England. So the Salvation Army went out into the world to address this issue. In fact, they were very unashamed about it. They said, remember the poor match girls? Remember the girls and the women and the children who would get this awful disease, this disorder of the bones? Well, not only are we fixing that by using safety matches, but we're also paying fair wages. Now, if you can't beat them, join them. So, that Salvation Army match factory finally was sold to Bryant and May, the manufacturers I referred to earlier, on the 26th of November 1901. And from there on, red, phosphorus, safety matches were commonly used throughout England. In fact, just seven years later, it became illegal for anyone to use white phosphorus after the 31st of December 1910, following the passing of a law in 1908. So that's acting justly. What about mercy? Commentary I looked at in preparation for today says, to love mercy adds the thought that anyone who is in a weaker position due to some misfortune or other should be delivered, not reluctantly, but out of a spirit of generosity, grace, and loyalty. The picture I've got here is of a lady being received into a Salvation Army social service in the 19th century. You can tell the softness of the character of the Salvation Army lady receiving this stranger into her service. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this picture 
and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the lady with her back to us in the picture. Now, the moment the painting depicts, this has come from, there's a Salvation Army documentary series called Our People. Um, Major Peter Farthing, uh, who's a good friend of mine, uh, shared with me what I'm going to read to you in a moment, but I would encourage you to reach out um, to, uh, to, to, to look at the, the series Our People. You'll probably find it quite accessible on the internet, but if not, and yeah, you're really keen, please do get in contact. I'd love to um, introduce you to it. It's got some really rich introduction to the stories of the Salvation Army in our, in our past. But the lady depicted in that picture who had her back to us, the one in the blue with the hat, his name was a lady called Rebecca Jarrett. When Rebecca Jarrett was 14, her mother began taking her to the London Pleasure Gardens. These were pubs with entertainment areas, popular pick-up spots for prostitutes. It was 1870, and sexually transmitted diseases were endemic and much feared. Certain middle and upper class men believed that they could have safe sex if they used young girls. Rebecca's mother saw an opportunity to make a few shillings, so she put Rebecca to work. And prostitution became Rebecca's daily life. Her mother and brothers got involved in the business side. Meanwhile, Rebecca drank to block out her pain, and in time she became an alcoholic. 25 years later, when Rebecca was 39, the drink had ruined her health, and Rebecca was terribly ill. By then, there was a new sound on the streets of London, tambourines and bass drums and singing. The Salvation Army was well known. People crowded into its indoor meetings with their raucous singing and testimonies and fiery preaching. Unknown to most, the Salvation Army had just opened its first social work centre in Britain. The house in Hanbury Street, Whitechapel, was there to help sex workers start a new life. One night, a desperate Rebecca Jarrett walked into an army meeting. She was dressed in very gaudy, showy clothes with a big blue feather in her hat. The Salvation Army people immediately saw she was in distress and they went over and spoke to her. You can leave the life you have lived, dear, they told her. We will help you. If you like, you can come tonight and stay at our home. Rebecca thought about it. Then she said, I'll come with you. So they took her down to Whitechapel. So I want to pause for a moment before returning to that picture. And I want to tell you that God introduces people into our lives for a reason. And the Salvation Army was introduced into Rebecca Jarrett's life for a reason. And Rebecca Jarrett was introduced into the Salvation Army's life for a reason. In 1885, there was a publication in the Pall Mall Gazette titled The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. It was a collection of articles written by, uh, or edited by a man by the name of W.T. Stead, who was a famous journalist. And this was effectively a campaign together with the Salvation Army to eradicate um, the very thing that Rebecca Jarrett was introduced to when she was a young girl, and to begin a movement for lifting the age of consent in England from 13 years to 16. Now, Florence Booth, as pioneer leader of the Army's William, uh, women's social work, had gained an insight into the lives of girls working as prostitutes. Through this work, the practice of trafficking girls to be used for immoral purposes, both in Britain and overseas, came to the attention of the Salvation Army. Son of William Booth, Bramwell Booth had walked the streets of London, seeing for himself the desperate situations that many of the young girls found themselves in. And what he prompted, what he saw, prompted him to speak with W. T. Stead. With the help of Josephine Butler and Bramwell Booth of the Salvation Army, Stead got in touch with Rebecca Jarrett. He got in touch with her for the purposes of a sting operation. Stead prevailed upon Jarrett to help him to show that a 13-year-old girl could be brought, could be bought from her parents and transported to the continent. Despite her reluctance about returning to her old brothel contacts for help, Jarrett agreed. Rebecca Jarrett met an old associate, a procurist named Nancy Borton. Through her, Jarrett learned of a 13-year-old girl named Eliza Armstrong, whose alcoholic mother, Elizabeth, was in need of money. She arranged for Jarrett to meet Mrs. Armstrong, who lived in the Lyson Grove area of West London, and although Rebecca told the mother the girl was to serve as a maid to an old gentleman, there was no confusion whatsoever that she was actually selling her daughter into prostitution. The mother agreed to sell her daughter for a total of five pounds. Now, I did the conversion, and today, in 2020 Australian currency, that is $1,151, or less than the cost of an iPhone. On the 3rd of June, the bargain was made, and on that same date, Jarrett took Eliza to a midwife named Louise Mores, who examined her and attested to her virginity and sold Jarrett a bottle of chloroform. 
Eliza was taken to a brothel and lightly drugged to await the arrival of her purchaser, who would be W.T. Stead. Stead, anxious to play the part of the libertine almost in full, arrived. He entered Eliza's room and waited for her to awaken from her stupor, and when she came to, she screamed. Of course she would. Stead quickly left, letting the scream imply that he had had his way with her. Eliza was quickly handed over to Bramwell Booth, who spirited her to France, where she was taken care of by a Salvationist family. Now, of course, what could and was expected to have happened to this young girl didn't happen. This was a safe um, experiment to demonstrate how easy it was to procure a child for human trafficking. The Salvation Army told the story with the help of W.T. Stead through the Paul Moore Gazette, and only two months later, on the 14th of August, 1885, the law changed, raising the age of consent from 13 to 16 years. You might remember as well, the Salvation Army delivered a million signatures on a petition to the House of Lords for this purpose. Now, coming back to Rebecca Jarrett, much later in life, when Rebecca was a very old lady, when she had been a Salvation Army soldier for many years, when she had been a friend of Catherine Booth and Florence Booth and had served in Salvation Army social services, Rebecca said this, what she most remembered about that night when she first came into the service of the Salvation Army for help, she came into a warm kitchen and a Salvation Army woman standing up and saying, oh, here you are, my dear. I've been waiting for you. Isn't that powerful? And that visual just there just says it all. That's mercy. That's what this verse is talking about. And we still do it today. We need to keep doing it. Now, finally, I want to talk to the third part of the verse. What does it mean to walk humbly with God? Well, we have to put God first. We have to be in relationship with God. We have to pray. We have to listen. We have to live in accordance with God's will. What is that will? Well, what was Jesus all about? He was here. He told us. Love. We have to love one another. It was so important to him, so important to his father, that it must be so important to us. That's what it means to live according to God's will. And looking back again, in line with the other stories of Rebecca Jarrett and the Matstick Factory, what does the Salvation Army's past tell us about this? Well, it's simple. Others. There's a story here as well. Just before his death in the early 20th century, William Booth, the general of the Salvation Army, wanted to send a Christmas message to all of his officers and soldiers around the world. And they were spread widely even by that time. And the message was important. It had to be powerful. It had to be a call to arms. But it also had to be cheap. And telegrams charged by the letter. But what brilliance. Just six letters. Others. That's what it's about. So fast forward a hundred years and then some. That's where we find ourselves now. Just three months before his death, on the 9th of May 1912, General William Booth gave his final address. And what he told us then is the same thing he's telling us now and it's the same thing that Micah chapter 6 verse 8 tells us. This is how we need to be in relation with God and in relation with others. While women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, as they do now, I'll fight. While there is a drunkard left, while there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the very end. That's illustrative. That tells us what we should be doing. That's how we need to be 
acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. Now, friends, the music's going to play. And as it plays, I just want to leave those words on the screen for you. I want you to talk to God. Ask God, how can he introduce you to circumstances where you can act justly in your life, in your world? How can he help you to show mercy, to be kind and caring? How can he help you to walk humbly with him and to do his will? Ask him to reveal to you every day opportunities for this and listen.